Welcome to Daily Devotion with Ken Gurley. Devotions designed to inspire you on your daily walk with God. Here's your host, Ken Gurley. Good Tuesday morning to you muchachos and muchachas. Yeah, just working on my Spanish. How am I doing out there? I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> That you're all here. You guys are the best. Muriel, Paula, Monica, you are the best. Happy that you're here. Sorry that I'm just a minute or two late. There's a reason. There is a reason. And I think the reason is because I was a minute or two late. Yeah, that's the reason. Happy that you're here this Tuesday morning and glad. What? Wait just a minute. What? <laughs> Who has shown up? An interruption, an interruption. This is Tuesday, right? It is Tuesday. This is your day. Well, you always give me such a hard time about coming on Morning Devotions on Tuesday. And I asked Ken a question this morning. Uh, what? I said, are you sure you want me to come on Morning Devotion? And he said, thought about it for a minute. He said, okay, okay. And I said, <laughs> Are you ready for everyone to actually meet the ghost writer of what? all morning devotions? What? what? <laughs> the ghost writer. She is here. The ghost writer has made it. So anyway, here I am. I'm Tessie Gurley. And I just want to say how much we love this family, this devotion family. Thank you for your dedication every morning. And I want to say to my husband how much I love him and appreciate. Aww. I love you. Aww. I appreciate your dedication every morning. <laughs> Thank you for being a part of us. It's our joy every morning to get up and see all the comments, pray for your needs. And we're just all getting ready to go to heaven together. We love you. <laughs> all right. She made it. She made it. I told you she would make it one day. She would show up. Sort of like, I don't know, like Jesus coming back. He's going to show up one of these days. And uh, but anyway, she wanted to come up here and say hello. We've given her such a hard time. And uh, she's she's up here fighting back just to let me know that if I give her too hard of a time, she's going to climb those stairs and she's going to be here. What a great day. What a great day to be here and to see each and every one of you. And that's why I was a little late this morning as we were trying to figure out where, I always have this little chair beside me that she can sit on, but the cameras were really struggling this morning, focusing in on two people. So happy to see you using adversity wisely. That is it. That is, that's the phrase. I woke up with that phrase rolling over and over in my mind. Have no idea what I dreamed of last night to give me that phrase, but that's that's just what it was, using adversity wisely. Um, well, we're in our relationship series, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure we'll get, get uh, around to the relationship parents have with children. It's something we want to teach our kids, that things don't always go our way. You got a choice. I mean, you pick up the marbles, you can go home. Uh, we have to teach them how to handle the setbacks of life. When the things go badly, when things don't proceed as planned. And I think it's a lesson we need to remind ourselves again and again and again. And for some reason this morning, I started thinking about John the Baptist and what his calling put in him, what his parents put in him, what life taught him and what the Lord taught him. It's this resiliency factor. Uh, it's a TED Talk, Tammy Duckworth. Her talk on grit, it's pretty amazing. It's grit that makes the difference. Not IQ, not EQ, it's grit. A resiliency factor that should put in there. It's the faith born of endurance that leads to perseverance, grit. And this man, John the Baptist, had grit in abundance. Yes, sort of the John Wayne of the New Testament, the true grit of the New Testament. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, that's that's just what hit me this morning, John the Baptist. So here, here's the definitive verse, Matthew eleven eleven. 
I mean, if your name was in the Bible, wouldn't you like it to be 1111? Yes, Matthew 1111. Verily I say unto you, among them born of women, Jesus is speaking, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Wow. He can teach us some things about using adversity wisely. It was in the 15th year of the reign of Caesar Tiberius, about a couple thousand years ago, nearly exactly a couple thousand years ago, John the Baptist emerged from his rugged homeland of southern Judea. Now, he wore clothing that was not off of Fifth Avenue. He came in the prophetic model like Elijah, whom the Bible compares him to. He had a camel's hair garment with a leather belt. Malachi said he would come, Elijah, Israel's heroic prophet. He would come on a mission and turn the father's hearts to the children, the children's hearts to the father. There would be a work of reconciliation. Jesus said John came in the spirit of Elijah. He came heralding the messianic age that Messiah is here. But as was common with the prophetic motif of Elijah and other prophets of Israel, John seemed to preach that Messiah's delay in coming was until the sin issue was dealt with. An ax had to be laid to the root of a sinful tree and a crooked path needed to be made straight and works of repentance had to be brought forth. Wow, you talk about adversity. Now that is a rough ministry right there but it's a needed ministry. It's the call to repentance. He called for a baptism in water, hence his title, John the Baptist. And you see, it's impossible to separate the man from his message, John the Baptist, who baptized people unto repentance. A statement that the old should stay old and the new should stay new. It was a confession that Messiah was coming. This guy, this guy put up with some stuff, okay? I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, first world issues like uh, the guy in front of me is driving too slow or, you know, my phone didn't charge last night or I've got a hangnail. No, this, he endured hardship. It was in the wilderness, his style of ministry. He rose against the powers that were. He spoke truth to power the religious hierarchy in Herod. It's interesting. I I don't know. Rennie, let me just say, uh, Donald, let me just say something I noticed about John the Baptist. He didn't focus on the evils of the Roman Empire. I think this is a lesson. He didn't focus on the decay of the world around him. No, he focused on those who should have known better. Those who had this knowledge. And the multitudes of Judea flocked in the wilderness to be baptized by John. Jesus went as well to fulfill all righteousness. But as the Lord's star ascended, John's star descended. It's one thing. It's one thing when you're on the upward trajectory to have grace. But it's a greater thing to have grace on the dissension. And as the Lord's star ascended and John's star descended, Yes, he must increase, I must decrease. The multitude shifted, the crowds shifted from following John to Jesus. John even directed his most loyal disciples, behold the Lamb of God, follow him. And soon Herod and Tippus imprisoned John in the fortress of Machaerus on the lonely hills east of the Dead Sea. Cut off from all, John the Baptist was just kind of hanging out waiting to be hung, yeah. just hanging out, waiting to be hung. Talking about using adversity wisely. And we're looking at John the Baptist, this child that was born to Zacharias and Elizabeth, born under Nazarite vows, born to be a man of adversity. Yes. Man had a dream that all of the wealth of the world rested on one side of a set of scales. It tilted heavily toward earth. Then an angel came and laid a single baby on the other side of the scales. And soon the groaning and the creaking and the shifting weight could be heard 
and the scales were tilted in favor of the child. Because the worth of a child is more than all of the worldly value combined. Socrates said it. Why do we waste so much time on that which passes away and spend so little time with our children? A child is worth our time. A child is worth our energy. A child is worth our finances. John the Baptist was so blessed by his parents. You may not have a lot, but you can bless your kids with your prayer. You see, John, John's parents had godly priorities. The parents of John really are the key to understanding this man born of woman who was the greatest that ever lived, Jesus said. They weren't ordinary parents. They were a powerful team. A dad named Zechariah, who was a priest of the order of Abijah. The mother, who was a descendant of the first Mosaic priest, Aaron. They were leaders. They were responsible. They had duties. They fulfilled those duties. And the Bible says that both of them were righteous. Righteous. John was blessed with parents who prayed. The key to letting the next generation survive and thrive in harsh climates, the harsh climates of a 21st century post-Christian, post-modern world is to have a prior generation who knows their priorities, who knows how to pray. They could hear from God. Zacharias, the priest, was going about his duties before the altar of incense, if I remember correctly. And while he was offering up the incense, the angel Gabriel appeared and said, your prayer's answered. Your wife Elizabeth's gonna have a boy. John had parents who prayed. He had parents who praised. He was burning incense, offering up incense when heaven appeared. And for the first five months of her pregnancy, we read that Elizabeth hid herself away for five months, Luke 1. She said, thus the Lord hath dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. <laughs> they were prayers. They were praisers. Okay, Elizabeth, you've praised him for five months now. But the Bible said at the six months, someone came knocking at her door, none other than Mary. Mary and the unborn Jesus. You keep praising God and Jesus is going to come. He's going to meet you there. I'll go one step forward. When the unborn John heard that the unborn Jesus had come to call, John leapt in his mother's womb. And the Bible says Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And it's then that Mary gives the Magnificat. My soul doth magnify the Lord. <laughs> she stays with Elizabeth for the last three months of her pregnancy until John is born. John. And when Zacharias wrote his name on the tablet, his tongue was loosed and he began to prophesy. And everybody in town knew something special about this boy. Chains of praise, interlocking rings of rejoicing. Godly parents. If you want your children to use adversity wisely, Get godly priorities. Learn to pray. Learn to praise. Wow. So here goes John into the wilderness. From the beginning, John's life was directed by God. What manner of this child? What manner of a child would this be? That's what the whole village asked when he was born. It was obvious this was no ordinary kid. Heaven gave John a name, Jehovah's Gracious. Heaven gave John his spirit. Gabriel said of this man, he will be great in the sight of God, filled with the Holy Ghost since birth. What of, what of this guy? Heaven gave John a calling when Zachariah's tongue was loose. He prophesied over his own child saying, you shall be a prophet of eyes. You shall go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of sin. Gabriel said, this boy's not going to touch wine. He's going to be no stranger to fasting. He's not only going to be a prophet, he'll be a Nazarite for days. That was a short-term vow. But no, John was a Nazarite for life. Don't drink wine. Don't be controlled by any other spirits. 
other than the Lord. And he was toughened and he was shaped by his environment. Here's what Luke 180 says. It's very rare, by the way, that you say a verse 80 in the New Testament. Luke 180, and the child grew and waxed strong in the spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. Raised in the hot burning desert. He didn't look like other boys. He didn't dress like other boys. He didn't act like others. His environment opposed him and it strengthened his reliance on God. Could it be that what you're going through, could it be, Sonia, Thomas, could it be that what you and I are put through If you're going through a dry place, if you're going through a rocky land, if you're going through a barren landscape, if you're going through a difficult season, it's that God is matching you for the mission he has for you. That God is preparing you for the season that you're going to step forward. His culture opposed him, strengthened his confidence in God. The Pharisees opposed him. It strengthened his trust in God. The king opposed him, but he still fought on. It was said of Jesus he was crowned with thorns. John used his adversity wisely too. He wore his thorns as a crown. He wore his difficulties as a badge of honor. He used his adversity wisely. There was no piece written by an American Indian named The Invitation. He said, it doesn't interest me what you do for a living. I want to know what you ache for. If you dare to dream of meeting your heart's longing. I want to know if you can get up after the night of grief and despair, weary and bruised to the bone, and do what needs to be done for the children. It doesn't interest me who you are or how you came to be here. I want to know if you will stand in the center of the fire with me and not shrink back. Can you use adversity wisely. John the Baptist was hidden away in an adverse place, hidden away in a wilderness. I remember the last Holy Land trip we were on. Some of you may have been with us that we went into the the, uh, land of the Essenes. We went up overlooking the Dead Sea Valley where the, in Qumran, where the scrolls were found. You looked at the harsh environment and they claim that that's where John the Baptist was before he was revealed. And there's some indication that they may be true or at least he was conversant with this group that was all alone, a remnant in the wilderness. And John the Baptist came out of that wilderness with a cry, make straight the crooked paths. He was shaped. He was formed by the crucible of his environment. The drosses and the impurities were removed and he came forth as pure gold. If you look at the history, I I will tell you, look at the history of any church, any church you attend, and you're going to find people that went through the fire for that church to be there. You look at the history of our Pentecostal pioneers, poor, desperately poor, uneducated, unskilled, Skilled, but from that disinherited class, they arose. Children of oppression, children of wilderness and despair, the desert. This, from this dispossessed class, they came and they made their mark on history. Oh, child of God, all daily devotion family, just feel it. Use your adversity wise. The same sun that hardens the clay melts the wax. Let your adversity melt you, remove the impurities, and then forge you into the person God needs you to be for this hour. What did Jesus say of John? He was the greatest child ever born of woman. But then he didn't stop. He said, but the least in the kingdom is greater than John. God has given you, Marcia, Talisa, Linda, God has given you this season for a reason. Yes, he has. 
He's given it to you for a purpose. That God is leading you through the tough times to forge something in you. It was one of my last jobs in my prior vocation before entering the ministry full-time. I, uh, I was a CPA in a Fortune 500 division here in Houston. And one of my last tasks, it was just sort of an interesting task. Um, I, I, I was sort of in this mode where I assisted both the vice president of finance and the vice president of operations. And and anything where their two worlds overlapped was sort of my niche. And whether it was a profit center in Calcasieu Parish, Louisiana, whether it was a, a manufacturing facility on Maracaibo in Venezuela, or I um, that that's usually where I was, and that's what what happened. And, I'll never forget the day they, they came to us and they said, our, our supplies, we, we made, one of the products that we made that we were known for were these little high pressure valves that they use in offshore platforms. And we had to have quality metal, a quality forging to make these high pressure valves. And they were not satisfied with the quality. They were not satisfied with the deliver delivery. And so in corporate headquarters up in Connecticut, they said, we're going to build our own forge. And so we actually did. It was really cool. A few miles south of where the main office was, the main plant was, uh, here in Houston, we, we started to build a forge and um, built a company, bought a company, built a, a new forging plant. And, and I just did the books for it. But I, I wasn't interested in forging, but I got fascinated with it. I had to learn something about it to do what I was doing. And when I would go to the forge as they were testing it, and I would see, I would see, I would see this block of metal go into the forge and superheat it. And I would see this forge come around it and compress it and shape it and get it to the place where it could withstand higher pressures. The Bible said we should not be conformed, pressed into the mold of this world, but there should be within us a fire and a glow that the Lord can shape us. Because the pressure you and I are going through right now is to prepare us for ministry. God does not delight just in causing you adversity. God allows that adversity in your life to forge in you a strength and a resiliency that you can to remove the flaws where you can step into his kingdom expanding mission and not fail in the time of adversity. Use your adversity wisely. Yes, God has a plan for you. John the Baptist, greatest born of woman, but we who are the least in the kingdom are greater than John the Baptist. Step forward, use adversity wisely, and watch what God can do. Join me with over on KYCC in just a few moments for our devotion over there. And uh, thankful for this group. Thankful for each and every one of you. Thankful for our Facebookers. Thankful for our YouTubers. And Twitter, we're trying to get on there as well. Thankful that each of you join in and make this the family that it is. Facebook, like, follow, share, YouTube, subscribe. Look forward to seeing you later. Go have an amazing day and may the Lord be with you and God bless you. I don't know. I don't know when Tess is coming back up here. I don't know. But one of these days, we'll hear her. We'll hear her coming up the stairs, probably on Tuesdays. Yeah, maybe, maybe soon. It's been a long time since she's been up here. So I don't know when it's going to happen again. But miracles do happen. God bless you. Go have a wonderful day. Thank you for sharing in daily devotion with Ken Gurley. We pray this ministry has been a source of encouragement and strength to you. Please be mindful that your financial support enables us to meet with you each day. To give a donation or connect with us, visit our website at kengurley.com. There you will also find the latest books, 
podcasts, and resources. Blessed, 90 Days to Change Your World is Pastor Gurley's latest book. You can get your copy of this life-changing book at kengurley.com. May God's favor rest on you in every way until we meet again.